Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Syria Security Seminar here at Purdue University. It is my great pleasure to introduce today David Carroll from MITRE, and he's going to give us his perspective on identity management. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of identity management, um, talk about some models and possibly some use cases that I've seen. I've uh, worked a considerable amount of uh, my, the last 10 years of my career in identity and access management for both corporations and for federal government agencies. And um, I, I like to say I've either seen it, built it, or broke it at some point. So <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting. And uh, I, it's a very unstructured talk. I, at any time, if you have a question, just give me a, uh, a hand and we'll, we'll talk about it, any issues that uh, you find intriguing. So the overview, we're going to talk about what is IDM, the evolution of IDM, how it's uh, come to the state it has, the, a little bit more about the history, some common models, some examples from the field that I've, uh, I've actually worked on. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about some lessons learned, some things that when you do uh, find yourself out there in the industry or, or uh, working uh, in this field or in this part of the security field that uh, you should um, pay attention to. So I, I try to define identity management. Um, there's a lot of mo models out there. Some folks think that identity management is simply provisioning. Some think it's directory services. Some think it's uh, a little bit of both. Um, I over the last few years, have, I've actually tried to define a model that uh, covers user provisioning, access management, and federation. Federation being the newest uh, entry. And um, at times, I've, I've liked to try to put privacy management into that, but uh, that's uh, actually moving into a different area now, and, and so I've, I've kind of kept that out. It's identity management. Um, is is a it can be procedures it can be technology it can be standards it can be a, uh, any any number of things that manage the digital identity life cycle and what I mean by that is it can automate the user experience it can manage the work entry and exit so what you do when you get on site what you do when you leave the site um, it provides now in the federation world it provides for access and authorization across the enterprise as well as outside the enterprise. Uh, and it can uh, also cover some roles and, uh, and some rules for data access. We're going to talk about each of these models just uh, a little bit. Come, come up with a, uh, a, a structured model that kind of relates to the other security technologies. You'll see here um, the security controls going up over the, uh, in the orange side of your screen there. It kind of spans all the layers. But the important things for this um, discussion are the IDM technologies, which you have the user provisioning and identity, which covers LAN, WAN, apps, external partners, um, and then impacts federation. In there, as you reach the outside, you've got your security perimeter. But under that um, user provisioning and identity management, you have a user account for everything you do, um, no matter if it's you know, logging on, using uh, anything from using your speed pass in the morning, getting on your bank account. Uh, I, I, at one time, tried to count how many identities I had um, on the internet, and I, I think I came up with about 29 before I decided that was too depressing. So <laughs> I went back and, uh, and and took a look at it again, and I think I'm down to about 10 now. So I'm, I'm getting better. Uh, access management um, c covers all these, and uh, it relates to the business data and also the network system. So I, th this is a very simple way of looking at, at how these technologies fit in. And I like to try to present them in the middle of, of these layers because a lot of the companies and a lot of the ideology and the thought out there that today in the industry is that this is a type of security middleware, that anything classified as identity management, access management, provisioning is really going to become part of a middleware. Um, so for example, if you're talking about WebSphere, um, they've actually started taking out the, uh, the authentication technologies out of the WebSphere platform and putting it into the Tivoli side of things, which is an uh, identity management middleware tier. Identity management uh, started out, and I, 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 I've researched this a, a bit, and most of the time when I see IDM evolving, I see it coming out of a movement for unified directory services. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a there there was a big movement to come out of um, disparate directories that we're going to talk about in a minute and move to a more centralized model. So directory services almost always starts this process, and I've seen it in industry. Basically, identity uh, my identity management started um, in in about 1997 with a with a project that was basically 
to take user information and provide a fee-for-service model for, for a company. So they need to know how to identify people, what their attributes are, in order to make sure that they are gaining net access to network services and that their cost centers are paying for them. So uh, basically they asked, well, what, what, do, what do we need to do that? And the answer was a directory service. So that starts the ball rolling. Pretty soon you have unified directory and identity. And then you work your way into access management. And then finally, the uh, evolution reaches federation, which is moving outside your borders. So you can read through these um, large enterprises, inadequate methods. Um, almost always, I, it, I don't know how many identities you, you have here on the Purdue campus, but um, I guarantee you probably have more than one. And it's probably used for very different things. And um, there are different degrees of management of those identities. Some of them are very self-service oriented, where you can go in and change your password. You can put password, you know, what's your favorite color, what's your dog's name, that, that type of thing. And then you have the kind that require a lot of work. You've got to call up a help desk. You've got to you know, issue a ticket. Um, the motivation for IDM in most cases is that large organizations can't handle that at scale. So they, they look to technology to try to reduce the impact of that. Uh, some of the earlier studies uh, from Burton Group and Gartner uh, cited sometimes, I, I think one of the numbers was at one company was up to $400 per month per user in lost labor every time they lost a password, and they had 14 of them. So it was a considerable amount of, uh, uh, amount of investment in, uh, in, in folks losing time. So that's, it, it's, a big, it's a big factor for companies. If you have someone who's working a, a, uh, a customer service center or if you have someone who's working a reservation center or something like that and they start and they get locked out and they're unable to service the client for X amount of hours, they're basically unable to do their job. The, uh, the, the evolution also of land-based applications into web services really amplified this evolution. Uh, there are a lot of folks wandering around talking about um, you know, why they should centralize their directories, but then it became evident, um, and the best example I saw, I've seen of this in recent years is uh, you have Active Directory from Microsoft, which is a very, um, very robust operating system, a network operating system, so what I would classify as a special use directory. Uh, it, it worked very well for, for LAN access and, and even to get you into your email and everything else, but the problem is when you get to a large-scale web application that requires users who have no access to printers or file shares or things like that, it really, the model kind of breaks, and that's a lot of overhead with the replication that that directory service does and the, and the network cooks that it has to, to deploy that in lieu of deploying a very simple, straightforward user database or, or a directory or a sta standard LDAP directory or something like that. Um, so even Microsoft in recent years has come out with a new product that basically is a standalone directory because they saw the need to separate those two. And, and that really was born out of web services, the ability to provide large customer bases, instant access to information across tiers and across, uh, you know, from, from, the, from the presentation tier back to the data tier. There are standards. I, uh, um, some of you probably heard of uh, Security Assertion Markup Language or the WS Security Standards, they're out there. Um, they are the basis for supporting large-scale federation. And a few years ago, I was actually out at um, an IBM research center, and they were talking about the implications of large-scale federation to grid computing and how the, the basis for doing effective grid had to be trust across these environments. And I think that that's a highly relevant uh, and interesting case for why identity management is evolving. We all have to trust each other, and we have to trust each other across boundaries that were not thought of before. The product lines in this in this area are narrowing. Um, they, they, there's the innovation curve, and it started out, I think I went to um, a couple of conferences back in the early, the late 90s, um, and the 2000, 2001 uh, conferences. There were hundreds of these technologies, and now they're being bought up. Um, and, and you'll see folks like Oblix being bought, uh, I, I believe they were bought by Oracle, and you'll see Microsoft buying several IDM technologies. And they're, they're starting to consolidate into the, into the big players in the market. And, you know, Novell bought some, uh, Sun bought Netscape and, and its, identi its identity management and its directory service. They're, they're also providing out-of-the-box out of federation capabilities. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here has worked with some of these, but there are SAML hooks. There's WS security and, and SOAP messaging in, in a lot of the Tivoli products. There's uh, almost every one of these technologies providing some type of, of hook out to, to a federation of some kind. 
and uh, again, they see it as middleware. They're starting to actually make product lines that are, are dedicated to this. Um, that was unheard of three years ago. You heard about it in their labs, you, you know, whether you were in Austin at, for IBM and you were hearing it. They're, they're trying to consolidate it into a product line. And I think one of the interesting things there is there's two different rules of thought there that we're going to talk a little bit about in the access management area. One rule of thought is I need to control your enterprise. I need to put agents on all these machines. I need to touch everything in order to be effective at identity management. There's another school of thought that says I just need to be a resource and I need to talk to these different things, whether it's from the top down or from the bottom up. And both of them have their, their pluses and minuses. You'll, you'll see organizations like BMC and, and a lot of the big uh, uh, management vendors, BMC, CA, Tivoli, they, they kind of, they'll, they'll start out with one and then they'll do the other type. Um, you'll see the other type of application type vendors, whether it's Oracle or um, Novell or, or not, sorry, not Novell, but Oracle or um, BEA or IBM, they'll come at it from a different angle where they're providing a service to the, to the service-oriented architecture that they really don't care about managing your systems. We'll talk about two approaches in access management that'll make that a little clearer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about history, um, continue and talk about uh, uh, how I, I've seen a very good model of this. It's going to come up in a second, and I, I'd like to share that. And here's the model. Uh, this came from Ping Identity Corporation, and I find it very effective at, at talking about how this how this all came to uh, came to be. And they use the term silos of identity, which I like. Um, back in the early 1990s, um, I think one of the first uh, network operating systems I worked on was Novell. A lot of the other um, and this was Novell Network. This is nothing what it looks like now with MDS and, and the big uh, directory services that they do now. This was basically just a, and it was also tied to the protocol. So Novell was very much uh, tied to IPX. And, and then all of a sudden in 1994, you have uh, Windows, new, um, what they called at the time, uh, New Technology Advanced Server NTAS, and it became Windows NT. And that was the first one to really apply itself past uh, the, the NetBIOS type uh, internal LAN structure out to TCP IP and, and into the wide area network. Otherwise, it used to be that you had two separate networks. When I, and when I worked in, uh, I actually worked at, NI, at the National Institutes of Health early in my career, we had two networks. We had the LAN, and then we had what we reached out with, with the gopher and, and the waste searches on the internet. So you actually had to run two protocols on your box all the time. Um, it was, it was very it was a very interesting time to be a network engineer. It was, uh, you know, with broadcast traffic reaching out over IP networks, it was not a lot of fun. Uh, you move in, in, in the late 90s, um, about, right, about right about the time I started doing some directory services work, we were moving into centralized identity. So the thought became, you know what, I'm sick of having passwords, user accounts everywhere. I can't manage them, it's a risk to my company. As an, as an IA person, I need to centralize everything. And that really w was okay, and it, and it had a lot of traction for the time period that you talk about here until you started, and that was okay as long as you had centralized applications and your, and your house was controlled. You had a perimeter and you had things that were inside the perimeter and rarely did you reach outside the perimeter for significant data sharing. Um, so, you know, we all started to centralize. We all started to do things like uh, meta, meta connection tools where we were moving data from s separate directories into a single directory and, mi and at the first part of that we were actually migrating away from those directories. So we'd consolidate and then stand down those, those <coughs> other directories or those other databases that carried user information. That only lasted for a while for various reasons. Um, a lot of it has to do with politics and, and business control. A lot of it has to do with structure. Um, some of it has to do with wide area networks and having to um, reach across a network for identity. Uh, I've seen um, this specifically when you're reaching across a network with a, you know, less than an ISDN line and you're trying to do active directory replication. It's not pretty because Microsoft kind of assumes that you have a well-connected network and in that term they usually mean a T1 or better. <laughs> so, you know, you're trying to span this thing and trying to replicate out a, a directory structure that's huge for a corporation. You just, you know, you eat up 80% of your bandwidth just trying to replicate. So it became, you know, okay, well, we've got to develop these trust models. And, and you, you know, that's, I think it came out somewhat prematurely and caught folks by off, off guard, but they took the real directory models, the forests. Um, a lot of, any, anybody here developed an AB forest? You have forests and you have trees. And uh, there are various levels that you talk to each other, various levels of trust. And uh, it's interesting that all that really is based or it can be based around geography, it can be based around politics, but really what it's usually based upon in that model 
is network bandwidth. Is trying to make sure your replication strategy reaches the, the end endpoints and that you're not missing things that you need, whether it's directory attributes or information about a user that an application requires. Uh, that can become a real management headache. So uh, centralized, you know, it, it works sometimes and it still does work sometimes. There's usually a, an enterprise directory in an organization and that can be a human resources database. I see our our, uh, our distinguished CISO here laughing about that. That's <laughs> something that uh, is, is a lot of fun to deal with. It, and, and normally it's not even a directory. It's usually a database about things uh, that, that other people will rely on. Uh, that's the simplest way to explain it. So now you move past the internal enterprise and identity management into internet scale identity. And this is where I need to share information with a provider. They're going to house it for me and give me a, a really good uh, price point if I you know, can reach out with some of my data across the internet space. And as bandwidth came up and as the internet became a more reliable uh, you know, um, and more commercialized entity in the, late, uh, in the late 90s, this kind of, I kind of disagree with the model a little bit because it overlapped. There was probably at a time in about 2000 where people started scratching their head and going, gee, how am I actually going to you know, deal with this when I have to talk to another organization, another company. E-commerce back in the dot-com days drove this really strongly. They're like, I, you know, I need to do uh, my, I have one company doing, con you know, customer relationship management. I have another company doing inventory. I need to actually get that data real time back and forth. So what you saw was the development of um, identity, uh, you know, synchronization, identity queuing, all these other um, types of peripheral technologies. That actually, you know, and then somebody figured out, okay, well, I need to standardize that, otherwise we're going to be talking about 70 different languages and, and no, no one's going to be effective at this and it's just going to miss the mark. So you have the, uh, the, the folks from, you know, the, the Oasis folks, you have the, uh, the Liberty Alliance folks who started to come up with standards for this somewhere around, I think it was 2000, they started, um, and I have dates in here for when they were actually delivered. So I talked a little bit, of, I've already talked a little bit about isolation of identity. Um, I really think, um, even to this day, I, you know, a lot. Of, I, I was involved in a lot of Novell to Windows NT um, migrations in, in the late 90s, and to this day, I think Novell's big problem there was not actually their directory services are a fine product. It was their 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 focus. They just did not know how to focus on on the next level, the things that they they needed to care about, the federation of identity. They just didn't see through that, and um, they they played in the land space too long, and they got overtaken by Microsoft. And, you know, they still have a great directory services product, but it is much more service-oriented, architecture-based. And um, I, I, you know, I really do believe that they're very, very good at that. And the, the domain login and trust. I remember when I was back in the 90s when I was getting my Microsoft certification. A lot of non-IA people really struggled, struggled with the concept of a domain. And to this day, it is impossible to try to explain that because now, now that that's focus, when you say domain to an IT person, they generally think Windows 2000 or, or Active Directory or Windows NT. They do not think a security domain, a perimeter, a, a zone of trust, something that you, you know, know the rules on and something that you can assert the rules on. That's what it really was back then. You had trust models. You had one-way trust, two-way trust. All that is basic, you know, IA competency. It's all, all things security folks learn. Um, in my case, I learned it very early on. I was in the military and learned it in, in ComSec school. But you try to explain it now, and it's like, what do you mean? Do you mean a, I, I get that probably weekly. What, do you mean a Windows NT domain? <laughs> and I just, I, I just look at them and go, no, not really. I just mean something that you can trust, something that you know, know about. Um, I talked a little bit about centralization. Um, account lockouts and forgotten passwords across the enterprise began to cause losses. If there is a silver bullet for an identity management and provisioning project out there, it is account lockouts and forgotten passwords. I mean, just think about it. How many times have you gone to your bank and said, I need to change my password and gone through the, uh, you know, it's either very easy or very hard. Uh, very few people do it in between. It's, it's either I can just go in there and change it and do do everything just fine or not. I went to a, a federal government site where I needed a PIN and I actually, you can go in and you can automate and you can release your PIN, but if you want it replaced, you have to go through a mail-in process. It's like, okay, <laughs> at this day and age with the technology we have, why do we have that? Um, and they, they tie it to their risk level. So, you know, that means either the technology has to get better or the for folks doing that application have to interpret the risk differently. 
we, I talked about the need for federation. The same drivers for consolidation of identity actually apply. So we said, okay, we've got to make it easier. We've got to make it more standard, so we're going to consolidate the identity within the enterprise. But once it's spanned outside the enterprise, it actually changed the model. And so now you're not just talking about communicating within the network. That was easy to do if you're consolidating. But now you're talking about talking across networks and across boundaries. So that chain, it just flipped the model to federation. Now we need to abstract and, and send our information out. And uh, the standards, security assertion markup language is an XML-based XML language. It was promoted, it's promoted by Liberty Alliance. It's in release 2.0. Uh, it's, it's actually become quite robust and, and quite interesting. Um, there, there's a lot of SOA, service-oriented architecture work out there using SAML and federation. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, deeper about those models. And then Microsoft and IBM, and in true fashion, if you've watched the standards being delivered, if they start out with a big company and become a de facto standard, it's interesting to watch how they uh, end up, you know, Netscape, for instance. Uh, they, you know, they started with SSL and turned that over to the standards bodies, and now it's TLS. Um, people still just, you know, use SSL. Um, TLS is out there, and people are using it, but they still just use SSL because it became a de facto standard. And Netscape was pretty easy to turn that over to. Now, WS Secure, Microsoft and IBM, um, that was, if you followed that thread a few years ago, that was actually a fairly interesting discussion. It was very... Uh, um, you know, they, they, they wanted to assert more control over that. And so they only turned over parts of the standard. So if you read about WS, there are, you know, there's WS Privacy, WS uh, Security, WS Federation, W. <laughs> I mean, it goes on and on. I think there's WS, I forget, I think there's WS Authorization or, or Authentication now. It, it, it's crazy. It just has gone to a level. But the ones that you really need to care about are probably this, the, 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 the WS, the Identity, the Privacy, the, the, and the uh, WS Security itself, because that's the transport. And the bottom line. Um, Visually, basically, without federation, you've got user authentication. You're going to have separate identities. Um, you will not achieve single sign-on uh, across boundaries without some type of federation. And I don't want to just talk about SAML and talk about WS security. There are other ways to achieve federation. And one of the models I have later on in the discussion actually discusses how to do that without possibly using federation technology. So we're going to talk about common identity management models. And um, I'm going to talk about user provisioning, web access management, and federation. And I've, I, there are a lot more models out there, but these are the ones that I found in um, my career to be the most prevalent. And they're the ones that um, you start out with and then you can get into a lot of variation on. The top-down user provisioning. Uh, when I was first doing a user provisioning project, uh, we had this, again, we had this idea, you know, you, if you're innovative, you tend to reach far, and and you know it's like um, uh, I, I forget who who told me, but you know you always reach for a level higher, and that way when you only attain half of that, you've actually gotten to the mark that you should have gotten to in the first place. <laughs> so, so we always reached higher with these things. We'd sit in our, our think tank at the places that I worked, and I and we'd go, yeah, we want to do this, and we're technologists, and you know we can make it work. And then you hit the business side, and you realize that there's a lot to that. There's a lot of justification and a lot of uh, politics and a lot of things that um, require a lot of deft maneuvering. So how that leads into provisioning is that the first step I took at provisioning, I wanted to reconcile the entire enterprise. I said, you know what? I don't care where somebody changes their password. I don't care where they change their account information. I'll manage it wherever it is, and I'll make it find its, its way. <laughs> it, was very, it was a very naive approach at the time. Um, and it was, it was probably maybe the eighth largest local area network on the planet at the time. So it was just, it was a very aggressive thing to try to do. Um, it was a lot of fun though. And so we, uh, we ended up kind of getting stopped dead by the, the limitations of the technology. When you're talking about um, changing, you know, for instance, passwords. If you're talking about changing a password in an environment with over two million people, um, on a daily basis you're talking maybe password changes at, three, at a three month rate, probably 500 per day and you can break down the rest. It's a lot. And if you're trying to do that from various perimeters, like um, when I say, um, I think Control-Alt-Delete, you know, you're doing it from the Windows NT side, or you might be doing it from a web application side, or you might be doing it from, you know, any type, you know, your database. Um, you never know where, where, that, where that thing's coming from. So you have to have these agents running on everything, and you have to kind of try to reach out and then try to reconcile those with a transactional model. So you, because you have to make sure it, it matches. You got this one changing, then you have this one changing, and then it's got to go out to everything else. 
that is a lot of processing to do. So we kind of hit, hit a roadblock with the technology back in the early 90s with that and decided that it wasn't mature enough to do that. It's still a valid model, just not mature enough for the size organization we were in. And so we went, um, at, at the time it was uh, a university um, that was actually doing a top-down model. And I remember talking to their IA director and saying, God, I got this problem and the technology is just not going to make it. And he goes, then refocus on the problem. And he said, go top down. He said, only allow them to go from the central location and do what you know you can manage. And that was, you know, at, at the time it seemed like, well, but I want to do all the cool stuff. No, just do what you can manage and keep to the plan. And, and that, that actually proved uh, to be, to be uh, pretty effective. So in the top-down model, end users access a self-service center. Um, I don't know if you have anything like this on campus, but uh, I, self, self, self-service center. Yeah. Do you manage all your accounts there? Or is it just majority. the majority, but you do it once there, and you're not? Uh, are you permitted to change anything in the in, in the underlying systems? It depends on where the system is managed and who owns that system. Okay, so it's it's still right distributed. Now, the centralized um, process is not where it needs to be. It's not really a self-service process. You actually you know, call the help desk, and they they okay. meet you, and then they'll change. So it's not app. yeah. When I'm speaking of um, user provisioning, really, it's, they've made quite quite a few leaps and bounds in this area. They have um, workflow models now with these. They have triggers. So one of the things I find is interesting about this model is when you do get a self-service in place, even if it's something simple like a password, you can start to do very interesting things. For instance, um, contractor temporary employees. This is always a, a real problem because how do you track somebody? You know, HR or human resources was always focused on, I get them in. And then it's usually Office of Security that gets them out one way or the other, and you'd be surprised how the disconnects happened in there. But then they were like, okay, I've got um, seasonal. Think of, think of seasonal employees, folks that come on for a set amount of time and then go off, and then they repeat year after year. Do you create a new account for them year after year? You know, that, it, it's just, it gets very, very cumbersome on the systems. So some of the provisioning technologies actually allow you to trigger events. You can actually build on, build on a workflow and say, okay, so I brought them in the first time, they're good for this long, and it, you know, the timeline goes by it, it, and they can recertify, which is a very interesting concept. The biggest problem that we have, which I think you're going to be talking about, is the authentication in a remote process. If you have somebody come to the yeah. desk and show you a driver's license, okay, it's easy. I can look and see whether or not you made it at Kinko's or whether or not the BMV made it or, or 80, 90 percent accuracy rate, right? Yeah. But over the phone, how do I vet that person? How do I exactly. know if they're not social engineering me, uh, especially if I've got uh, faculty that are need to access the campus and they're on sabbatical, they're out of the country, they're away. Yep. Um, they're doing research and they can't afford to come back on campus. There are a lot of universities that actually require somebody to fax a copy of their driver's license to the help desk before they can be. So, and then going through a, a challenge question process, you know, we can find out your mother's maiden name by going to the county courthouse, those kinds of things. You know, so giving them the opportunity to put in a challenge question, you know, mm -hmm. that whole nine yards. We're running into actually people wanting more human you know, face-to-face, high-touch high environments. Yeah. The Citibank commercials that make fun of the, the phone menus, you know, and you can, if you hit zero, you'll get to a person. Um, we're finding that self-service, automated, you know, web-based password resets are running in the roadblock. A lot more people prefer a human. Sure. You know, but then again... It's a policy question. And it's a, yeah. it, it, I discussed this a little bit earlier. It's a risk. It's what you determine, what you can trust, and what the level of those systems are. Um, I was discussing with... Um, with with uh, one of the folks I, I talked to today about about what the vetting processes are, what people feel comfortable with, and what and, and I tied that basically to the government work I do in e-authentication. You've got levels that you must attain in order to meet Federal Information Systems Management Act, and it's you know that's a broad brush. But then you get into really what do I care about? Um, how many factors do I need, and how do I package those? How do I protect those, and what do they mean? I have a great example of this. I had an IVR system, a voice recognition system, to change passwords for a benefits application. This is your benefits. Two things you'd never mess with. Are, I mean, one, one is folks' vacation time. The other one is their paycheck. Never mess with either. <laughs> so, so, you know, you go and you're doing these benefits and you're like, okay, I've got all this stuff and I, you know, I want to change my health care or whatever. I want to put in my health care spending account. And they do it over an IVR system. So they do voice recognition to do it. Well, they weren't protecting the database that the IVR was in. So they had a biometric they, they, it took the longest time to convince these people that that was biometric data, that they couldn't just leave it sitting in a DMZ somewhere touched by the internet. 
And so, you know, you, you look at that and you go, they, they go, why do you mean it's biometric data? I'm like, it's something you are. It's your voice. You know, it has a, why, why do you think the system uses it? It's a print. So on the policy side, they thought that was a good thing. The auditors were like, we can do that. That's, that's legal. But on the, on the technology side, they're like, well, we don't understand what that's useful for. We don't think it's real. And so there's a big problem there that, that keeps bubbling up to how you protect uh, that type of data and, and what you actually consider biometric data. Um, in the top-down model, administrators also use this facility. That was a big thing that I, I, I really, that caught me by surprise. So you have um, a remote administration, a, a remote administrator out there, and you have a top-down model. And I'll show you in a minute why this is important. You have somebody just going in to user manager and just, you know, changing passwords. <laughs> None of it gets propagated anywhere to the other applications. So then you get a negative effect of users starting to call up. And, and so when you do the top-down model, it has to be all or nothing. That's one of the, the caveats to it. Um, the, the changes to the underlying systems are, are they, they are basically forced down to the systems. And uh, no account management is allowed at the target systems. This has gotten better over the years, but it's still, if you're going to start simple and you want to do user provisioning, this is the way to start. And you, and you basically start with one set of applications that you can trust, work your way down from there. Hello? OK. So uh, this is kind of hard. Uh -huh. You guys can see it on the screen or not. This is one of those diagrams I had trouble with after they told me about the, the uh, television requirements. I had to change up everything. Um, but basically, this is, you know, at the top you have Joe user going in. Step one is he initiates a password change. And step two over there is begin orchestration. So change password equals this password. He's got, in an IDM environment, the way this works is you have to go and retrieve out of the directory Joe user. You have, to look at, you have to look at a policy database and figure out what systems that they are relevant to. And then you have to start reaching out to those systems. And some of these systems are not very smart, as the last one. Um, one of the things that your IDM, and the reason I put this in there is because this is another one that caught me off guard. If you are basic, basing identity on a role, so in other words, you have a database and you use role-based access control, um, I can't change a password for a role because every time I change the password, someone will get locked out. So, you know, that's one of the systems that um, you either have to do something very creative and, and notify everyone of the password change or you just have to give it up. And generally, right now, what I'm seeing in, in most systems that I see provisioned is they generally try to they try to stay away from that one. And there's just not not adequate. Um, and it might have changed in the last six months, but there's not adequate technology from what I've seen. So, for you know, you retrieve this profile, and then these um, agents or these other types of technologies start reaching out to these systems and changing the the various passwords. And they do it through a transactional model. So they commit on both sides, and then they agree and they put it in a log ton of forensic information, if you, and that's a, an interesting point. If you've ever tried to track one of these systems, you know, firing all those logs into ArcSight and everything, you're talking about just thousands of lines of data as, as it goes through and it, it, it tracks all, the, all those changes. It's actually fascinating to look at, but um, and if you have the time, you can dig through it and find everything that happened. But I, I was asked a few years ago, can you prove that X user went and changed all these passwords on, on this system? It took about two weeks to dig through the data for one single change. It's, an, it's just like security incident management. I mean, it's a ton of data. And, and it, you know, these systems are not smart enough yet to can, you know, canonize these things up to a level that's, you know, abstract them up to a level that's readable through meta tagging or whatever. They basically record everything. So anytime they access something, anytime they get a SID from Windows NT or they get a, U, a UPN hit from Windows 2000 or they get a web, you know, an NCSA web log saying they logged in, they track all that stuff. It's, it's nice, but... Um, really not usable. Um, reconciliation. This is, uh, this is the one I told you about that I tried first. And it is a good model. And the technologies are getting much better for this model. However, uh, it, it must be applied sparingly. Uh, the, it, you're, you're allowed um, you know, access at the perimeter. So for instance, a good provisioning model on reconciliation would be pick the one that, pick a reliable one and pick the one that you know is going to change you know, the most and focus on those systems. So in other words, like your LAN operating system, you have to change your password every 90 days or whatever your policy is. Focus on that one primarily and maybe one more and you can do reconciliation. But the technology is such with the logging and the, and the actual throughput to the back and forth in these transactional engines that these things use right now, that if you try to do much more than that, you really get into a, a, a quagmire. I remember when we first tried modeling this, and this was probably three years, 
maybe four years ago. Um, it would just bring it would bring the transaction server for web in this case for the for the for the web environment to its knees. I mean, it would just after about five hours, it couldn't keep up with the changes any longer. Uh, it again very resource intensive, and the performance characteristics on this one. What folks want when they change a password. Um, the worst thing to go and try to explain to an IT executive or an IT manager above you is why I changed my password on my LAN operating system and it took 72 hours to propagate to the rest of my systems. That just doesn't fly. They, they don't want to hear that. This is the age of automation. It's the age of instant automation. So they, it better happen just like that. And if not, know your limitations and just stay away from that one. Uh, it's done through agents' meta directory integration. Um, there's a lot of tools out there that do a wonderful job. But directory to directory integration, whether you're Microsoft or IBM or anybody, they, they all have about the same level of tools. Um, they've come up in the last couple of years. And directory virtualization, which is basically I make remote calls out to a bunch of different directories, and for you, I make them all look like one. So it's sort of like a proxy. It just handles the request for you and then goes and retrieves separate information from separate directories. You need a really good network for that one usually. And so this is the reconciliation model. So you can see it starts again down, it starts down at the target system. I change, I do a user initiated change. I change my password. The agent in this case has to detect that change. So that's another thing. When you're running this against a, a network operating system, it has to actually detect the change as it's happening. So it's looking at the event log, for instance, in Windows 2000 and going, user, Joe user, change password, boom, boom, boom. And then it has to initiate events based on that. That's a dicey process if you've ever done you know, real-time monitoring of a log to, to initiate an action. Automated response is, is, is challenging. So you get up here to um, number three, you retrieve the user, retrieve the provision profile, and, and you begin to reconcile, and you do the same thing you did in the top-down model. You just do it um, you know, with the knowledge that you're not going to rechange it on the target system. And you would be surprised how that surprises you when you first do this. We did this, and we couldn't figure out for a week why every time we changed our password, within about five hours, the password changed again. And you started to create a loop because the, the, at the time the, the engines weren't smart enough to realize that they needed to disable the agent that, of the system that it originated from. Otherwise, it went back and changed the password and the whole thing started all over again. Sounds silly, but <laughs> you know, it happens. So you go, you, that's when you get back to the development team at the company. You go, did you really think that one through? Because <laughs> they you know, they've got database experts. They've got you know, um, user interface experts. But there's not a lot, and, and this is an encouraging thing, there's not a lot of IDM experts out there. There's not a lot of folks who understand the workflow of, of user entry through user exit of an organization. And it is going to be, it's going to continue to be a big one. Um, talk a little bit about uh, identity management models as they regard web access management. This is one of the ones you probably, are, you really probably interact with, you just probably don't know it. Um, I, I've used this one as, um, it's a wonderful amount of technology, but it's really sort of anticlimactic when you see it. Because generally when you see it, it's I use one name and password and I get to all these different websites. And, you know, anybody use Microsoft Passport? <laughs> all the IA guys are going, no way. <laughs> well, Passport was like an attempt to do this, but it, it really is one of those things that's, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't show you a lot. If it, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't, then you get lost somewhere and you have no idea how you got there. So the installed programs translate requests to manage normalize access management rules. This is a big one. You know, managing your policy and your rules across disparate websites is very important. I've, I work, um, one of the organizations I worked with started out their access management policies this way because they had unauthorized access by, by populations to their website. So they decided, I'm going to take them all under the umbrella and I'm going to control identity because it's about the only thing I can control. I can't control the developers. I can't control the, you know, the, the network connections very well. The only thing I can control is the front door. So they decided to consolidate the front door. And I'll show you how they did that. Um, agents use the native platform APIs to talk to the target system. I'll talk about two models. One is a reverse proxy-based model. One is an agent-based model. And um, they usually, it usually requires less code modification to the web application when you're talking about agents. Um, they tend to interact at a level below the web app, web app and, st and at the operating system. So if you're talking about Windows authentication, you're talking about doing um, you know, challenge response, MS CHAP or something like that underneath the covers and it's interacting with that. It's doing what's, what's it basically has a trust association interceptor that just looks at the call as it's going through and then mimics it. Um, the reverse proxy is, is much different. 
So this one is a uh, is an example of an agent. You basically reach out with your web browser through a perimeter. You hit a web application server in a in a DMZ usually that has an IAM agent on it. You have backend apps and you assert yourself to one IAM agent and um, the, the arrow I did not put in is basically these things usually talk to each other. So once you assert yourself to one IAM agent, you can actually talk to the other agents in the in the environment. You still have a policy server, you still have a directory server. One directs rules, one directs identity. And they are very different technologies. Reverse proxy. Um, one of the benefits of reverse proxy is it tends to make a contiguous web space. So you start out with hr.mycompany.com and uh, you know um, payroll.mycompany.com and all these different websites. And eventually what it becomes is mycompany.com slash hr slash payroll. So it all looks like one website. And, and that's, uh, that's interesting, but it has challenges when you write applications because you have to remain relative to a root. So one of the first things I always tell developers is, you know, instead of putting in your, your host name, put in a dot dot slash. So it just goes back to whatever the root was because that, that really, it's one of the most basic things, but it really just causes chaos in this model. Um, it also separates users from direct access to the web server. So this is one of those things where you can actually put your web servers on the inside of the enclave and you can use the web app, the reverse proxy as, as the point. So it's the thing in the DMZ talking. And sometimes that's beneficial to the web application, sometimes it's not. So this model, basically, you come in, um, I show myextranet.com, it becomes, so if you had HTTPS, myhrsystem.com, it becomes myextranet.com slash myhrsystem or something to that effect. And um, you're touching the web application servers and notice that they're inside the perimeter, not in the DMZ. And you're still using the same policies. Um, this, this is very easy to invoke single sign-on because you're asserting yourself to one entity and then you're passing that information via HTTP request back to the back end. Um, you can do a lot of interesting things with this model. You can take out a lot of the uh, uh, authorization. You can federate authorization. You can um, pass it in headers. You can go and grab information from the directory. And I'll show an example of that in a, in a few minutes. Federation. This is where we get into the, uh, the interesting uh, high-end models. There, is a, uh, there are two models. There's um, a local site first model and then a destination site first model. And um, the local site first model is known as a cross-realm approach. And this, they talk about this thing in, um, in Federation called an artifact. It's, basi it's basically a piece of information that gets passed between the systems that, that is able to be opened and identify the, the, the person. It's, and it's a common format that they share. So SAML, when you're talking about security assertion markup language or these federation technologies, you generally talk about an artifact. The, uh, so in a cross-realm model, the artifact crosses the domains after it's authenticated. And I'll show you that in a second. The, the model challenges the user first on the local site, and then it asserts to the destination site. And it usually does this, um, one of the things that the security folks get, um, you know, we, we get up in arms, it is it usually uses a cookie to maintain state. And everybody has a love-hate relationship with cookies. It, but it has to touch the client somehow to, to span the two environments. It has to have something common. And that com commonality, in this case, is the client. So if I were to look at this model, this is um, from Oasis. This talks about you're accessing the source site. You get a challenge. You log in. Um, it deploy then you get a link to a remote application. You select it. Then you get a redirect. So basically, you're challenged on, on the source site, and then it redirects you to the receiving site. You can see up here, separate, there's a responder and an artifact receiver service that kind of negotiate behind the scenes. And that can be done by a dedicated network connection, or it could be done by a mutually authenticated SSL. But it's usually a secure channel that these two talk to each other on. <coughs> and then you get a redirect, basically, to the, to the destination site with a cookie. And uh, you're at the remote application. And, and you notice on this side of the model at the destination site, there's no access checking. You're basically asserting and you're forcing your access. You're saying, I am authoritative. You take my, my token. Destination first model. This one's a little confusing to try to, to, try to take a look at it first. Um, they call it artifact approach. And I've, you know, I've struggled with that just because everything has an artifact. Um, but this one's really about. Um, about who, who actually starts the artifact. The model redirects access requests directly to the destination site. 
So this is, you'll see the model in a second. And the traffic from the site of origin is redirected to the target once authorization is complete. So it's kind of a, a roundabout way of doing the same thing. So let's go through the model again. The access, you access the remote site. You, in, in number two there, you are immediately redirected to the destination site to its portal. It goes into its processing, so it does its credential challenges on that side. And then basically you are told, okay, you have the SAML, the SAML request, the SAML response. It does the same thing on a secure channel. And then you end up right back there at, um, you know, it, there on, uh, on, on six, it, it, it actually transfers the artifact back before it does the transfer. So it, now you're on the other side saying, um, I don't trust you to assert everything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna automatically pass you off to my destination site and then it's gonna tell me you're okay to get in. It's an interesting trust model because you really are placing all the live, and the, the, the reason these models are different most commonly, I tell folks federation is not techni technically very difficult to do if you understand web services. The legality and the, the business process around federation can run you into a lot of, a, a, a lot of steps. So these models really, are te they're technologically focused, but they're also really focused on who bears the risk. In the first model, I bear the risk. In the second model, my partner bears the risk. So if you're talking about, um, you know, basically, proving that someone's you know, being fraudulent or what have you, you're passing all that in the second model to, to the person who's, you know, who's, who's basically being um, accessed. So you're, you're, as a remote portal, all you're doing is acting as a, as a, as a proxy. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples here before, um, before we wrap up. Identity management. I, I've, I've put two examples in here. One is a corporate benefits app that I did a few years ago, and the other one is the government PIV standard, and I think uh, there will be a lot of folks who find that kind of interesting. The uh, corporate IDM integration, the benefits. There were competing requirements to outsource the application but retain corporate identity control and monitoring. So they said just what I said in the, in the, in the uh, Federation talk. They wanted to outsource this. It was cheaper. It was easier for someone else to bear the, the infrastructure. Has anybody ever seen a PeopleSoft deployment? They're generally very, very big. I mean, they're, they're, uh, in a large corporation, they're very expensive, and, and you have to have a high level of technical competency maintained to do that. If that's not your primary business, you know, your business job is to do HR, you know, they'll go and they'll outsource that. That's the, the application service provider model. So when this company is looking at this, they said, yeah, but you know what? We don't trust folks with our identity. We want folks to trust us to manage their benefits. Remember I said it's a touchy subject when you get to benefits and pay and things like that. There, and there's also a considerable return on investment. Um, this is the number that I had when we did the project. Seven dollars it cost to, to make a single call. Now think of a benefits application where you've got 75,000 people changing their benefits on a yearly basis in November. That call center also goes up by magnitude. So let's say they get, they get 200 calls an hour. At tiered levels they start charging more because they have to ramp up more. So at 5,000 calls an hour projected, they're going to charge you probably $10 a call. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it, that's the way they do it because they have to ramp up their capability to, to accommodate you. Um, the web costs 50 cents. So when they're looking at the numbers, the business folks are going, I can give you money to do this or I can you know, continue to do this. The difference was so, so incredible. The, the web infrastructure to do this was probably not even a tenth of the cost that they would have paid you know, to do it via traditional method. The corporate identity integration was a requirement. They made a stand on enterprise identities. They gave it out in their, fed, in their packet. They basically said, here's your enterprise identity. When you go into this portal, change your password. And going forward, not only will we use this for benefits, but we will use it for access to everything, including changing all your attributes. So they took it very seriously and they tied it to the HR response because what's the one thing that everybody pays attention to every year? If you're in a business or in government, you pay attention to open season because you have to change your benefits. You have to you know, make sure that you're in the right program. Um, the pins were terribly difficult to remember. They, they were emailing pins out every year and every year people would forget them. So about 30, 30 to 40 percent of the people that had pins would have to call up and get new ones or you know, and then you get into that vetting issue. How do you get someone a new pin? Generally it, it costs because you're mailing that out to folks. There's a cost <laughs> incurred there. Um, and HR could not use social security number any longer because of privacy issues. So they couldn't vet you based on your social security number. They weren't allowed to, to ask it. So that's where privacy kind of knocks you a little bit for, for a loop. 
And you know, the bottom line was users were all expected to know their corporate EID. So the goals of this were to provide seamless integration and single sign-on from a corporate web portal to an off-site benefits provider. So it really looked like a corporate website. No one even knew that they were going off-site. They had no idea. All the requests were proxied on the back end. Limit the sharing of company identities with the service provider. Due to privacy and due to concerns, they only wanted to assert certain attributes to this provider. And I'll show you how that was done. And then route all traffic using the corporate extranet portal and use strong authentication for all web services connections. So they, they wanted some pretty advanced requirements in the back end. They used an IDM, what, um, what you'll hear in the industry called an entitlement service. It's things about you that I can gain from a central repository and share with other applications. It's really what entitlements get you to. Retrieve the, retrieve the relevant directory attribute and pass the information to the benefits um, customer relationship application. They had a unique identifier. They said, we don't care how you authenticate people. We're, we're going to use this number. And you will find that more often than not in the industry that you will, you know, they'll inevitably want to use their own identity. That's where federation becomes very valuable because you're matching your identity with theirs in some meaningful fashion. They wanted to uh, manage the URL customization and they wanted to proxy controlled access and controlled session state. They wanted to make sure that um, people weren't hijacking sessions. This is, I had to stretch this model a little bit, but you in initiate the request. The reverse proxy logs you on. Hope you can see that. Um, you basically go ahead and start the policy um, process. So it determined that benefits UID, the univer universal, universal identifier, is needed for logon to the benefits app through entitlements rule set. So you plug in a set of rules into your, into your policy server that said when you're going to this URL, instead of passing, in my case, D. Carroll, pass my benefits number. In this case, it was a PeopleSoft ID. So take that out of the directory, do a quick lookup, and it would do things like cache that if you were a frequent user. I mean, all the wonderful things web technology can do. And it would send that, you know, it would send that EID to the back end. So a user never even, and, and most users that I, I encountered never even knew their PeopleSoft ID. They knew that they could get to this application specifically through their user ID, had no idea that they had a PeopleSoft ID. And so it goes through the back. Um, they get, they, it, it goes from the directory and, and picks up um, the attribute, tells the proxy to set the UID and the HTT, to the HTTP un underscore user attribute, which is the standard web logon. You're connected via the back end with a mutually authenticated SSL session. So both machines are asserting an identity to each other to make sure that over the internet they know who they are talking to, using SSL to do that. The web server authenticates the user as, one, you know, as their UID in this case. And the application retrieves the data. And so you're basically doing a reverse proxy web access management model. This is also a federation model, although a very primitive one. The latest thing I've been um, playing with is government personal identity verification. And um, there is a Homeland Security, pr uh, I actually support Homeland Security in my role at MITRE. I work for the InfoSec Center and I work for the Chief Information Security Office. So we have um, part of the charge, um, um, I've been told by my, uh, by my sponsor that I have a particularly arcane set of skills in PKI and identity management, so he, they, they put me on this. And um, HSPD 12 is really about common identity credential for all government agencies. They want to provide consistent information for visual identification and reduce the threat of terrorist access to facilities, services, and systems. And that includes things like you might not expect, like trains and power stations and water supply facilities and docks and you know, all kinds of stuff. And, and they want to enable emergency response across agencies. But define a common readable format, ensure mandatory attributes are present, and provide safeguards against forgery. Has anybody taken a look at FIPS 201? The audience? It might be interesting if you take, take a read on that. Um, it covers a lot of what I've talked about, and they actually put a lot of operational use to it in, in FIPS. The uh, logical access goals enable strong authentication. A lot of the government policies that I'm starting to see are going to require that second factor of authentication. And then the question becomes for folks um, like the U.S. Secret Service, for instance, how do you actually protect the, the biometric data that's on the card? How do you protect that second factor? And, and how do you get it? How do you keep it? And where does it go once it's being processed? Um, very important to law enforcement folks, as well as, um, as, as, well as military. Uh, secure storage of biometric data. Um, allow interoperable, interoperability of credentials and ultimately support information sharing. E-Gov and e-authentication and everything you hear about DHS, why did DHS come into being? Information sharing. And so anytime you say that and you attach it to a project, it's generally a good thing. 
allow use of common methods across federal agencies. The physical access goals provide storage and pro processing for authentication to electronically controlled barriers, entry doors, turnstiles. I was out in uh, the RSA conference and I was, I was asking the vendors, the door vendors like Lenel, how are you going to know if someone's revoked when you don't have a door that's connected to a network? You know, how is that going to happen? And they're actually talking about strategies to poison, the, you know, send a, a certificate revocation list on the person ahead of you so you poison the door for them. I'm still trying to figure that out <laughs> when I listen to them. I only got to listen to them for about 15 minutes, but I was like, that could be dangerous. That could be really dangerous, <laughs> you know. Somebody just take my card, take my hand, whatever they want to do, you know, that type of thing, if they know that that's the, that's the way. I don't know how they're going to do it. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting problem that you may want to look into and try to solve. Um, serve a common card format. I'm going to show that. And uh, reduce the number of separate credentials for sim physical access. I went to a, a federal agency the, the other week, and um, I've been telling folks this today. I obviously had an identity crisis. Because I went into the federal agency, walked in, and if you've been on a federal facility lately, you go through a lot to walk in the door. It makes the airports look kind of simple. Walked in, and I said, okay, I've got a DHS ID. They went, we don't accept that. This is a federal agency. I want to have a DOD ID. No. I have a West Virginia driver's license. Okay. <laughs> and I went, all right, you're not connected to that state in any way, but whatever. You know, and so I, I got in. You know, and, and it's, it's interesting. And in the same talk, they were talking about how the states don't trust the federal government for certain identity and credentialing, like a universal ID. But it's ironic that the government trusts the states. Wor worked for me. I got in the door. I got to go to my meeting. OK. Um, standard PIV card format, which um, you know has a lot of zones. But basically, this is what the card looks like. It's got an agency, a photo, and there's a lot of requirements around that. The overview, the identity management and card management is up there in, in, in the corner, and that is really where the focus of this information is. That you have a directory server, a lot of the things that you'll encounter in IDM technologies. Identity and attribute storage, which is um, the key management services, the vetting and user identification, the workflow. This, this system is probably the largest scale use of IDM technologies that I've seen to date, because it is going to be universal across a very large population. The federal government, it, it's not, it's not going to be trivial. And it's got, it's got a whole process to manage these cards. And GSA is looking into it. A lot of these organizations are looking into how they're going to source that, where they're going to put it, because it's mul these, are, these are huge systems. Card management subsystems, they're, they're looking into how to do that. You can see the vetting and issuance. They have a uh, identity card issuance station. One of the things they're doing with that is they're saying, I'm going to send the card to you. I'm going to FedEx it to you. But it will not be active until you walk in and someone with biometric access says you're authorized. They have to do a face-to-face -face check, they, and then they're going to flip an attribute on your card that allows it to um, be, be valid. So it's kind of like your credit cards. You know, you call up and say, hi, I'm, I got my card in the mail. And they do that via your telephone number. Vetting, again, it's just a, uh, you know, that supports I-9, identity verification, so all the things you put on your job application pretty much is what they're going to support, um, along with the national agency check from the FBI. They're going to take a package, and um, it's going to pass this package around. And this is where you know how you vet that data and how that gets transferred from platform to platform is very important. Card management system will accept the package, and it will generate the credentials and write the card. And then issuance is where you're going to get the card once it's done. And there's a lot of case studies out there from the DOD. Yes? So as long as I can make really good fake documents to, to get past the I-9, I'm OK? If I can come up with a fake passport, fake state driver's license, fake birth certificate? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, don't have an answer for that. I mean, there right. is bio there. We don't take bio data when you're born, yeah. uh, unless you have one of those nice footprints, you know, when you're a baby. <laughs> I don't know if it would match now. But could try, though. It would be interesting. Um, PIV 1, just so you know, the, the rollout for this, October 27, 2005, came and went. And basically, that just said, hey, we all have to have systems, and we know that we're in trouble if we don't. PIV 2 <laughs> is October 27, 2006. The system has to be operational, whatever that means. Um, certified and accredited, this, and that you know, is the standard government stuff. And then must issue a card. So you can imagine what a lot of agencies are going to be doing is on October 27, they're going to be rushing across the line with that one card. And then uh, they're going to say, we win. You know, we're, we're good. And um, I think. They'll probably, you know, OMB will probably be looking at them going, no, that, that wasn't the point. 
full rollout in, in compliance by 2008. I'm hearing that they're, they're thinking about pushing that, but um, it is an aggressive schedule. If you talk about the, the millions of dollars and, and the standards, I think there's only one card manufacturer that just came out of a NIST laboratory, and that's not going to make it. Um, you're going to need you know, five to ten vendors for, open sor you know, for, for proper sourcing through GSA. And lessons learned. Kind of talked about some of these, but um, I'll go through them real quick. Understand your organization and its processes, especially for user provisioning. Understand what the business process is. You would be surprised how naive you are when you walk in as an IT or a security professional and you think you've got it all down, and then they introduce something into the workflow that makes you chase your tail or makes you uh, iterate. That technology has to be able to handle that. Never build it and think they will come. This isn't Field of Dreams. Um, if you try to build something and think it's the coolest thing since sliced bread and think that the developers will just come to you and the business people, they won't. You have to have to work with them on that. Identify first key applications. Build alliances with their development teams. Get involved with these folks' development teams. Get under their skin. Figure out what makes them tick and what their methodologies are, and you'll be much more successful. Develop common integration models. When I was at my, um, when I, I worked for Marriott, I had four integration models, and I just put the book in front of application teams and say, here you go, pick one of those. If you want something outside that, then we'll have to talk. And generally, it fit. Develop service levels based on the type of integration, population to be serviced, and the frequency of the platform. You will have applications that have 50,000 users and are only accessed once a year. And so you have to maintain a performance spike and ramp up to that. Or you'll have applications that have 10 users and are used every second of every day. So you really have to do a lot of profiling to make sure you can adapt to that system. A lot of this is general systems work, but you know, in IDM and security, we kind of forget about that sometimes because we're a little detached from it. We just think about the policy and the principles. Understand relinquishing control of identity information is very difficult. Go and try to say, I want to take over the access to your database and watch what happens. You'll get, you'll get vehement no, and then you'll get, well, if you can help me, and then finally their management will go, it's going to cost less, do it. Um, develop pilot applications with high impact. I talked about this. Start with a modest approach. Um, baseline your applications prior to, a, prior to this. I've had a, through my career about a dozen of these where it goes, hey, you know, my application doesn't work. And the inevitable question was, did it work before? And they go, no. <laughs> what did you think this would fix? You know, this doesn't fix your transaction rate or the fact that your queues are blowing up or your database is undersized. That doesn't, isn't what IDM does. Um, Capitalize on uh, role consolidation. You'd be surprised. I, I did role consolidation um, a, and it for a couple of organizations now. And you go in and you go, okay, your division is this. Here are your baseline roles. And this goes back to directory management and the how you develop a directory. I, you get down to a, usually it's around 80% of the, of the role is, is pretty much the same. And then you've got some nuances and attributes. That's just what I found. It, it's very interesting because I haven't really broke the model yet. You can always, you know, you get a division together, they all perform a, the same business task, and they all pretty much share the same data. They just don't call it the same things or think of it in the same way. Observe and track innovation curves in the IDM platforms. Understand what technology is in, in its relation to its development. If it's new and, and if it's exciting, that's great, but sometimes it's lagging in performance or, or full integration or support. I had an application where they said turn on single sign-on equals true or false in the config file. Well. The application was written by a company and then acquired by a bigger company that had a lot of reputation in programming. And it was true or false, and when I set it to, I, I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. Well, true had a space after it. So true effectively when they were doing their search was false because it was five positions they were looking for and not the actual word. It was amazing that, that a company you know, of, of that caliber at that time, would, you know, I, w I won't mention the company, but it was, it was very interesting to call their development team back and say, did you catch this one? And that uh, leads us to questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, the one about the ID part, uh, so all the wonderful attributes, picture, biometric, everything is there. What is the purpose like of, um, like where can you use it versus, you know, what are the implications of it? Sure. Well, they're coming up with those models. Um, initially, the picture, of course, will be, you know, face on validation for the security guards at, at, at the perimeter. Um, the biometric data will probably be used for controlled access. I haven't seen any folks that are, you know, like for instance, I go into DHS, I walk through with my card and it has my picture on it, put my stuff through the detection devices. Then I walk upstairs, but I have to use my biometric to get into the CIO's office. So they, they, they're doing, you know, different levels of security based on the, I guess, the, the, the uh, risk of the facility. 
you get this card. It, it was used only for, you know, for one of those not so critical attributes, and um, it was lost. So. What was the risk? Is they, you know, I mean, the identity vetting right now is not going to go away. So I think that that's going to stay around for a while. They're going to have to have face on until they get better methods to to protect that information and to immediately notify that it's it's been, you know, compromised. Because you're not going to be able to do RFID checking through a doorway or or you know or any of the contactless things where a guard's not there. Or you might be able to allow them into the front door, you know, and they can stand in the lobby. But that might not even be good at some agencies. So. Yes, sir. How do you feel about the use or the what a lot of people want it to be the more use of biometrics? The the, the concern that typically gets brought up is that once that is compromised, you as an individual are really hosed. Yeah. Yeah. Because we can't change our thumbprint or our, our retinas not easily. No, nope, no, nope, can't do that. And yes, uh, the protection on those mechanisms has to be huge. I don't think it's particularly being uh, approached as a as a, as a single uh, factor. Yeah. As a, yeah, I I don't think that they're thinking about that yet. They're so embroiled in trying to develop these systems that I'm not sure that I'm sure that there are folks out at NIST that are thinking about it. I'm sure that there are folks here that are thinking about it. But I don't think that the government at large has gotten past. Um, I don't even think they know what to use the factors for yet. They just know that they need them. So and you know you went. Yeah. So you went. They went. I need identity, and I need two factors. So somebody told the president that. The president said, "What the heck does that mean?" Uh, well, here's what I need. I need two factors, and so they went. Well, what is that? And they go, "Biometrics." Okay, cool. Put that on the paper, and that's what we require. So NIST, you know, that that enables NIST to go out and you know fire up SP 83 and all the other different biometric standards. Enables GSA to acquire biometric data. But the hard questions are the ones that you're asking that they haven't quite answered yet. Um, because, you, yeah, and, and I mean, they do that now in like the PKI world. They have three different certificates, for instance, on a DOD card. One of them is an identity, and it's just the identity of the card. It has no biometric data. They've stayed away from that for, you know, keeping that on the card. They just have, a, yeah, you're vetted. And then they have an authentication, and then they have an encryption card, an encryption cert that gets um, escrowed. So in case you get run over by a truck they, or you lose your card, they can actually get the data back at some point. Uh, but the encryption one is the only one that's escrowed. The other two go away when the card dies. They immediately revoke them. And um, there is a lot of questions about where that data is kept and why and um, how it's packaged. Any other questions? No? Thank you so much.